Artist Dave Pearson lived in the Lancashire mill town of Haslingdon for 40 years. Few people would know about the extraordinary world he created in their midst until now. When Dave Pearson died, a small group of close friends and family opened up his studio, uncovering virtually intact the creative output of 50 years in the life of a very private artist. The unassuming house, which some neighbours had found sinister from the outside, was home to an estimated 20,000 pieces of work, from small coloured etchings to room-sized sculptures. This film is about the life and work of one of Britain's least known, but possibly most prolific and extraordinary painters. It's also a story about the struggle to save a painter's complete life's work from obscurity and destruction, and the attempts to open up to a new audience the work of a unique artist who shunned publicity and recognition as distractions throughout his life. We're human, we like a narrative. We'd like to feel that even if we can't talk to the artist in person, we can talk to him through his work. Uh, we can see what he was striving for. We can see how he felt and thought. With the majority of artists, frankly, you can't do that. There isn't enough material. I don't think I've ever met another person in the arts, and I've met thousands like him. If, you, you, if you'd met Deb at the bus stop, you wouldn't have known he was a, an artist. <laughs> More like a process worker, I think. Silence. Really didn't talk very much, very quiet. You had to sort of make all the overtures, really. He was a very quiet man. He had an awareness of what motivates everything in my book, which is this a sort of whatever you want to call it, a sort of sublime intelligence that sometimes we're allowed to just dip into and and feel, and, yeah. And it happens, doesn't it? It's a bit like falling in love, I think. He, he's a master of, of um, the imagination. Um, and that is incredibly inspiring to be around. Dave Pearson was born in London's East End in 1937. From his early teens he drew. He was inspired by his immediate surroundings in Hackney. His mother Anne at home. His father Sam, busy at his work as a tailor. The wider landscape of the Lee Valley. Work like this earned him a place at St. Martin's College of Art, and from there to the Royal Academy Schools, where he was a prolific student. But Dave's refusal to conform meant that he had never graduated from either college. John Warman knew Dave Pearson at school, and they became lifelong friends. It was just an ordinary household, you know. I mean, I, I probably came here first when I was 15 or 16. The thing about the entire family is they were very, very unassuming. He never stopped sketching. He was compulsive. On holiday we used to go all the time, a sketchbook in his hand all the time. I took this particular paint, this particular photograph, and um, yeah, he was just painting him. Surprisingly, he was very tidy here. As long as he didn't go into his own area upstairs, where they were cluttered and stacked. And they were eventually stacked downstairs as well. I think he's absolutely fabulous. That's Anne over there, uh, as, it, as was, in the sink. 
Superb. His father had been in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. Sam, of course, was a tailor all the time, and he made my first suit. I think it's the real change came between the age of 16 and, and St Martin's, and by the time he was going to St Martin's, I think his parents more or less accepted that it was an, obs an, uh, an obsession. I don't think I realised just how good David was until I saw his first exhibition at the New Art Centre in Sloan Street. And I helped him hang that, and he had been doing many, many things. He wasn't interested in selling himself. I remember that when he left the New Art Centre, they said there, which is a good gallery down, uh, down at Sloan Street, said, you have make another collection, you can have another exhibition. And he never bothered. He never bothered. But that was David. The natural landscape was a constant inspiration throughout Dave's working life. He first began to express his feelings for it in exhilarating drawing trips with John Warman. So when teaching posts in the Pennines in the north of England beckoned, Dave turned his back on the London scene and headed north. And from 1964, Dave began a 38-year association with what is now Manchester School of Art teaching mainly on the foundation course in art and design at Manchester Metropolitan University. Dave loved working on the, the foundation course at LMU because it's always been extraordinary in the way that it is so kind of creative and so buzzing. And uh, even now, it's, it's a really, really exciting place to work. At Manchester, his students found him an inspirational and an archic teacher who encouraged their passion and individuality. At home, he immersed himself in his own work. For Dave, creativity was an adventure that involved total engagement. Good Lord, you know, uh, he's doing full commitment to teaching and yet producing these beautiful giant pieces of work. Um, I thought, where does he get the time or the energy? Because he was so committed to teaching as well. And I thought, when does he do it? He must stay up 24 hours a day. If someone came up with an outrageous idea, he, he would, nine turns out of ten, say, yeah, go run with it, go with it, push it, you know, challenge things. So you open, open situations up for students. And that, working with him, it opened me up a lot. It gave me a lot of confidence just to take risks. But if you ask me how or why, or it's really hard, you know, even now with this long perspective to, to be able to say exactly what it was about Dave that was so, was, that made him so special and so, so expert a teacher. But he was, I mean, he was inspiring, not only to me, but I know now to many, many other people. Really hard to know now. Rare film of Dave at the college, leading students in what became a spectacular project inspired by Saint Saens' music, Carnival of the Animals. It's, it's their first encounter of doing art and design full time, really. And um, the Carnival of the Animals was set up to attract and I suppose to cater for students who were interested in textiles and fashion and using materials and making things and it was all going to be based on Samson's Carnival of the Animals and that piece of music. It covered just a whole load of aspects of working in art and design. The last um, sort of four weeks, month of the project, we'd be there till, you know, beyond seven at night. It, it was something that you were living and sleeping and breathing, you know. For the, for the duration of it, really. And, and I think a lot of that was down to, you know, just Dave's en kind of energy and commit, just his commitment to it. Dave spent quite a lot of his, his life uh, working in his studio and being very much on his own with his work. 
the kind of dialogue that he built up with students was just as beneficial to him as it was, was to the students as well. It was just part of this great fizzing kind of pot, which is, which is creativity. And when he saw it in other people, he wanted to kind of set it alight and get it going. And then he loved that himself. He, he himself got really excited about it as well. When Dave moved to Haslingdon in the 1960s, it was in economic decline. Mill closures had been relentless for decades, and many industrial buildings were empty. Large numbers of local people, proud of their self-sufficiency and strong work ethic, were out of work for the first time in generations. But Dave loved the warmth and grit of the people, and respected their down-to-earth integrity and lack of pretension. Across the north, in Leeds, Manchester and Liverpool, and small towns like Haslingdon, there was a kind of northern renaissance emerging in all of the arts. Flourishing in social upheaval and set in what became in some areas an industrial wasteland. There was quite a big community of painters here even then and I think a lot of painters gravitated towards this area because there was the, lots of old mill property, that was empty, that was standing empty, that people were desperate to get rented out, and it was possible to rent and even later buy a property that you could use as a painter, as, a, as an artist, as a theatre company, um, in a way that was very difficult to in almost any other part of the, of the country. So there was a real buzz going on, and it was, a lot of it was happening here in Rossendale. And the fact that it, it had, for some people anyway, a charm and, a, and an integrity of its own as a place. And then the, and there was the countryside outside, and the countryside is very beautiful. And Dave certainly responded to that and enjoyed that very much. We used to go out most weekends painting, and you only had to walk a few miles to go to the most glorious places. Dave was able to find a large, run-down house and turn it into a studio. When he was working, it was just work and that was it. He just totally, you know, transfixed on what he was doing, basically. Um, he didn't have many friends, I don't think, that used to come to the house for anything. It was just, you know... And when he used to go to the studio, he'd be there for hours. Hours and hours he could be down at the studio. And he'd just come home and have something to eat and then he might go back again. <laughs> Living next door, one of my main recollections of Dave, I suppose, is my bedroom was on the third floor at the top, and now I've learnt that his studio must have been next door where he worked because he would play music, soothing sorts of music, and then it'd get quite fast into the middle of the night um, because I recall my dad complaining because we were having to wake up the next day for school. Well, as a child, I used to think it was like a horror house. Um, because we used to walk past and stand across the road at the other side at the bus stop on a Saturday morning on our trips out and look up and see these huge figures, mashier figures, and just wonder if they came to life in the evening. We used to be petrified, to be honest. It was chaotic. Uh, every floor, every, you, you went, the potato eaters, the, the paper mashier potato eaters were in the entrance by the door and you had to push your way past these to get in to the, to, to the building. Every floor was full of work. And now it wasn't work like drawings, weren't vertical. They were flat and you'd got six foot piles of drawing in every corner of every room. And all you had in the middle was a space about five feet by six feet in the middle, and the rest of the room was just full of work. Yeah, the chairs would have been for Van Gogh's room. Which Video of Dave's studio filmed a few days before he died. And this important record gives an idea of the sheer quantity of work he produced. And because of the way it had been densely packed for 20 years, it's inaccessibility. It reveals the papier-mâché figures that were in ambitious shows across the north, inspired by paintings by Vincent van Gogh. 
Between 1966 and 1974, Dave made a vast number of paintings, prints, reliefs and sculptures on the theme of Van Gogh. Many transcribed Vincent's work or events from his letters. Scenes from sunny Provence were transposed to the beautiful but often dark valleys of Rossendale. Dave was, had done the Van Gogh exhibition of uh, paper mache, the potato eaters in paper mache. And it, he'd made a construction on the top, on the first floor. He had to take the window frame out, which is a hell of a big job, you know, an old wooden frame, and he had to take this out so he could get the, the actual structure out of the building. And he had uh, another part of the gallery, uh, another annex to the gallery, where he'd actually constructed the fantastic uh, bedroom, which is now lost, the Van Gogh bedroom. And that, that was well over life size, and that was in the gallery, and that was tremendous. And there was photographs in all the newspapers, you know, the Sun and uh, not not the Guardian, not the Times, but there was a, and there's Dave lying in this bed, uh, this paper mache bed. For many years, Dave also looked on Vincent van Gogh as a mentor. And to mark the centenary of the artist's death in 1990, he planned an ambitious project as a memorial. But Dave had this notion to build a replica of the, the bridge at Arles on top of the gunnery roof and uh, we all went up there. He wanted to do a Van Gogh exhibition, you see. And uh, he says, but I want to do the other bridge at Arles. He wanted to do it on the roof. And I thought, not look very big on there, like, you know, what size it, and then when he started, like, Jesus. No, no planning permission or anything like that, we just built it. The scale of the thing was horrific. We, we, we built these structures without any structural engineer. Um, it was pure gut, rule of thumb, would they stand up? Um, we worked late into the night, um, we relied on Vince to feed us. It was just a, a week of pure work, I mean, Dave relished it. But you knew exactly where everything had to go. And you knew exactly how to do it and you just get on with it. I was always amazed that uh, it was always right. And I thought, God, he must have had all that in his head. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. You knock the boxes away. In fact, I remember the police coming one night, we were hammering away at, I think, 10 o'clock at night, and we were complaining that the neighbours were um, were worried about what was going on, and we were putting these massive mortises and tenon joints together, trying to thump them together, which were overhanging the gallery. Really dangerous stuff. And then they, they brought the crane in and, and hoisted the thing up, and by a miracle it stood up. But that was Dave again, you know, risk-taking. And, and in a way, it's a bit like his paintings. This thing was built out of tiny, tiny bits of pieces. It, it was almost painterly, the, the way it was put together. Um, I think that he loved the whole idea of Van Gogh. And I think it wasn't just the idea that that a man could be so dedicated and so passionate about what he wanted to uh, communicate to the world. Van Gogh and figures in his paintings and letters vividly inhabit the landscapes around Rossendale through which Dave would walk and in which he would draw. One of the key pieces in a series of dry point prints made for an exhibition at the Serpentine Gallery is The Meal, an etching inspired by familiar figures in the life of Van Gogh. It's very suitable, I think, for Dave, because he, he, would, he would include everything, like he would include everybody. I love the white space of the tablecloth with everybody round and how he's made it all embracing. These figures are the potato eaters. And there's the, the postman, 
and of course this is Van Gogh himself coming through the doorway. The, the lamp, the roof is from the potato eaters and the, the, of course the, the hat with the candles on. I mean Van Gogh used to go out at night painting with, a, with his hat with candles around it. So he's brought all these together and it's just so beautifully done. The amount of work into it, you know, I mean it's just incredible. I know Van Gogh would have approved. He would certainly have approved what Dave was doing. Having decided on his themes, Dave researched his subject matter rigorously, and this is nowhere more evident than in the large series he produced based on English calendar customs. Dave was fascinated by those rites and celebrations traditionally held in rural communities around key points in the Christian calendar, many often originating in pagan festivals and ritual. Dave was fascinated by the oddness of the activities and the community spirit expressed by the people. He read widely around the subject and recorded his researches minutely in a series of beautifully drawn notebooks. When Dave died, they were buried in his studio. But like many other unexpected strands to his work, these items have now been brought to light as the work has gradually been uncovered and reorganised. I was always interested in manu medieval manuscripts, not just European and Western art either. He was interested in, in like Chinese art and Japanese art. And in all those cultures, they don't use the sort of perspective that we do. They use aerial perspective instead, which means that you can get um, a very high horizon and then you can get scenarios all happening sort of further down and they don't, dec they don't change much in, in perspective, in size, in relation to each other and he was, he was interested in that. He liked the immediacy of it as well and the, uh, the kind of childlike vision that it gives. The English Calendar Custom series also shows the versatility of Day's work and the range included pastel drawings, some several feet across, relief drawings, etchings and a large quantity of wall-sized coloured reliefs. Consume my heart away, sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal, it knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from... Dave Pearson's most ambitious series of works, and for him the most significant, was inspired by the Byzantium poems of W.B. Yeats. Started in 1989, the project took eight years to complete. The poems launched Pearson on a journey, culminating in a series of over a hundred canvases that could be combined differently to fit several exhibition spaces. Sailing to Byzantium and Byzantium represent a spiritual journey in which both poet and painter contemplate ageing and mortality and celebrate the transcendent power of art. And the vast scale of this exhibition involved panels six metres across, made up of as many as 20 separate canvases. It was one exhibition that might have been up for five weeks, and yet, you know, Dave just focused on making that into, into an event and, well, hang what lay around the next corner. But in so doing, he created just a tremendous five-week exhibition. I mean, they were knockout, they were stunning. I mean, just the square meterage of canvas he had to fill, and as well, you know, quite apart from making the canvases, stretching all those shape canvases that fitted around the main pieces, you know, it was years and years of work. In the process of making those really huge paintings, Dave also 
produced thousands of um, sort of sketches, things in gouache and watercolour and ink, loads and loads of studies just to kind of clarify the ideas in, the, in his mind. In the proper sense of the word, it was spectacular. It created a spectacle and that was very clear, it used every inch of the gallery space. It was uh, clearly a, a man who was on a sort of spiritual journey, a creative spiritual journey. And that's what, that's what, that was the first impression and the last impression of the show. And he also wanted to have far more space to show um, some of the large paintings, so he built an interior space. And that made you a little bit more intimate with, with the big paintings and increased this, this feeling of being inside a painting. But then the fact that he did have this interior space meant that you could go inside that as well. It's just a complete ex experience of being inside a painting. The experience you get when you enter the show of colour and, and it's like en this, entering the show is like entering another world. One of the exhibition venues was the Bead Gallery in Jarrow. I mean, all this stuff would come in and I'd say, Dave, we haven't got enough wall space for all this stuff. He'd say, oh, well, what about the ceiling? And you know, hey, it, it was fantastic. What a brilliant idea. And I, I, you just hung them up there, man. So people wouldn't have stiff necks looking up. I, I kind of got this mirror, plastic mirror. You could walk on it. And the pictures looked terrific through the mirror, like, you know, it really looked nice. And, and they, But they were all Dave's ideas, you know. At the end of the exhibitions, the paintings were brought back to the studio and carefully stored away. Years on, Byzantium was waiting for the chance to be reconstructed for a new audience. And out of the epic scale of Byzantium, emerged yet another challenge. By 1995, Dave's studio had become so full that he had little room left to work. He needed a much bigger space. And with the prices of mills still so cheap, you never know what you're going to bump into when you get to the top of one of these mills, especially up north, around this way. You never know what fantastic artistic joys are going to jump out of you and what you're going to find there. And I think Dave's one of those amazing things that you, you find at the top, on the top of a mill. Dave joined Globe Arts, a collective of artists based in a large mill space not far from the Haslingdon studio. During Dave's association with Globe Arts, from 1995 to his death 13 years later, he welcomed the camaraderie and exchange of ideas involved in working alongside fellow artists. I would see it as a spiritual process, the whole thing of painting. And I'm sure that a lot of us here up here work in that way, or maybe in a slightly folk way, or there's something outsider about all of us because of where we're situated. He initiated ambitious collaborative projects, in addition to his solitary explorations of personal themes. Dave retired in 2002 and I think he went through a bit of a, a period of, of kind of depression. He realised that he had symptoms that he needed to see the doctor about and um, he kept going to the doctor again and again and again and eventually he was diagnosed with, uh, with blad uh, bladder cancer. And then he went into hospital and uh, had the operation and it was quite a hard operation to recover from because it was involved quite extensive abdominal surgery. He was ill from uh, 2003 to 2008 when he died. But really during that whole period his, his um, health was compromised. He never stopped for a second being the artist that he, he had, he'd always been. And in a sense, I think feeling that his life might be coming to an end, it just spurred him on to be more and more and more prolific. When the ship is beginning to sink, and you're still making art, and you're talking about your condition, your emotions, your situation. This is particularly relevant in a modern society because the one thing, we've settled most of our ideas, social ideas, 
but the thing we've never learned to deal with is death. We deal with it less well than our ancestors, in fact. He, he scrutinised and explored what was happening to himself and his body and his, his response to that uh, in the only way or in the best way he knew how, which was through his work. And, you know, I think some of that work is painful, but it's, it's, it's very telling and, and I, I think quite extraordinary and some of his best work in many ways. But he had his camera with him and um, because he was so kind of friendly and so engaging in the way that he was, somehow he managed to get permission from uh, the nurses that he was with and the doctors that he was with and the patients that he was in the ward with to just take photographs all the time, just document the life of the ward. You know, he was a, a, a driven person and that machine in him, that, that whatever that mechanism was within him, the engine within him was unstoppable. You know, the way we would see it is, is that the, this is kind of the stitches of stitching you back together and um, it's all to do with the process of being ill and being in hospital. That's what it felt like, the blood and um, the stitches and your veins and that kind of thing. This period was quite difficult for Dave, well, you know, it was very depressing for Dave. And he did have lots of really quite black moods when he was here too. Yeah. It, was, it was for therapeutic reasons. I'm not sure that it worked in a therapeutic way, because it took him further into it. It didn't lighten his mood, but it enabled him to cope with it. Towards the end of his life, uh, grappling with life and death and mortality, and spirit. These are, these are difficult things for anybody, but Dave's taking them on. He, he had to evolve a, a language, a vocabulary that could deal with minutiae and huge things at the same time. I, th I think he really, really was trying to, I mean like Wordsworth, he was trying to find the spot of time, he was trying to see into the life of things. And that's what he was doing right up until the end. I mean, the later hospital works with all the stitches. They're, they're more about the nitty gritty of life and death, aren't they? When Dave was, was dying and he knew that he was dying, he took me to the Valley of Desolation, which I'd never been to before. But he took me there to show me the place. And when we got to the waterfall, and, and he hovered there for ages. He was just really excited by the, the energy in the place. He said very clearly that that's where he wanted his ashes to be spread. Dave seen during his last days, filmed by his son Chris. Soon after, Dave's close friend Bob Frith visited the studio and reflected on his own feelings about his friend and his work in a video diary. Make sure to make some order out of his work and um, and uh, listing it. It's just the beginning of a process that I hope will end up enable us to to get word out, to get people interested, to do something that never happened in his lifetime. Not only not only did he not sell any work or hardly any work, he was largely unappreciated, and yet he was a really exceptional man. Really but at this perilous moment in time, no one really knew what was going to happen to the studio or the work when Dave died. I don't know, I just kind of feel Another close friend and colleague, Margaret Mitten, shared Bob's sentiments 
and together with Dave's son, Chris, the group, seen here at a recent meeting, decided to take on the responsibility of rescuing the work. But they were faced with what seemed an insurmountable task. The amount of work inside was phenomenal and stored in such a way that made it inaccessible to catalogue or even to count. And because of the dilapidated state of the building, much of it was threatened. The ground floor had serious dry rot and was dangerous. Some of it had collapsed into the basement. Upstairs, holes in the roof had let pigeons in, as well as the rain, and pigeon droppings were on some of the work. In order to preserve Dave Pearson's work and promote his legacy, the group formed the Dave Pearson Trust. Dave Pearson's work was often described as epic. So appeared the task ahead of the Trust. Their first project involved the complete removal of all of the work to a neighbouring mill so that the studio could be refurbished and then returning it all when the job was done. The next job is to tackle Dave's shared space at Globe Arts. No one knows what lies in wait for the trust at the mill, but the work has to be cleared out. Members of the Trust and of Globe, as well as friends, meet to start the emotional task of deciding which of the works will be saved, as there is no room for all of it at Dave's studio. Dave's studio has uh, kind of been left exactly as uh, Dave left it, really, for the last two years, so none of us have really got into these hidden enclaves at the back with all his hidden work and, and it's amazing what, what's in here actually when you start looking. I didn't realise there were this many. <laughs> the chaos. So there's stuff coming up and stuff going down. What's coming up is an empty lifter hopefully in a minute and we're going to take this lot down. Margaret tries to photograph every item before it's taken away, the majority to the studio, but a large number also to Skips, waiting outside. We're keeping most of the work. I mean, inevitably, the stuff which is damaged, his, his old paints, his coffee cups, um, canvases and boards that he's prepared to paint on and never got around to doing. Yeah, it does. They, they want to carry it down. I'm not sure that we can go in. Julian Williams from the local Sea Gallery is looking for work to put together for an exhibition he's arranged to showcase some of the finds from Globe. Completely surprised. We just knew that there would be some gems, but perhaps uh, not the amount. But it's just been interesting to see just so many different pieces that you look around different styles, different times. Fantastic. The process is a testament to Dave Pearson's reputation as an artist of the imagination who could make art out of anything. And the volume of work uncovered here by the Trust is astonishing. Good. Good. I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel, even though there's still quite a long tunnel ahead of us. Um, yeah, I think we have uh, broken the back of it, as I say. Those two. They can be skipped. The day uncovers several hundred pieces of work, the majority of which is packed into a van which makes repeated journeys to the studio in Haslingdon. It's canvases now, lots of canvases to go. Yeah. Um, and lots of stuff to go in the skip. Well, I hope it can be done in two van loads, because I don't think we've got more space than two van loads of space here. The rest of it is going to have to be uh, given away or thrown away, isn't it? Now? Yeah. But there's quality control going on at the, the globe end, so we're making sure all the best pieces are coming here. This is nice.
Julian's discoveries form the core of a new exhibition at the Sea Gallery in the nearby town of Crawshaw Booth. In the two and a half years since Dave Pearson died, the Sea Gallery has hosted key shows of his work, which now attracts the attention of collectors as well as local people who have heard of Dave Pearson from local TV reports and the local and national press. I wasn't actually uh, familiar with Dave's work, but um, the first thing that hit me when I kind of came in here was the emotional, kind of raw emotional power of the work. So kind of like primal kind of resonance to it, which uh, which really really strikes you, and also the fact that they they are incredibly expressionistic, but um, fantastic colorist as well. Gosh, I can't remember. Is it the second or third one I've been to? We always go come to Dave's stuff, you know, right from the very beginning, you know. And they're always uh, blockbusters packed out with stuff, you know. Well, it's still going on even though he's not here. Dave Smith is one of a growing number of inspired collectors. Well, I just like it because it's it's one of his darker portraits. He's done quite a few which are, are much lighter and much more colourful, but this stands out as being much darker and just just uh, almost monochrome. But there's a lot there, and I, I just I just love it. It deserves to have that that recognition, doesn't it? It deserves to to be um, seen. I think. It, it, it still makes me go goosey, his work, you know, I, I get goosebumps when I see it and I think you feel that you have come across something that's so unique and so special. No, I was totally mesmerised when I saw the article in the paper and heard heard about all the amount of work that Dave's actually produced. I was shocked that one man could produce so much and how much time he's given to his passion. It's amazing. I, mean, I was in total awe of it, really. But this is fantastic to have somebody of such calibre who's done such fantastic work to bring some fame to Aslan and we've been brilliant. And I'm really proud to live next door. Reactions like these have made the Trust's first major task of rescuing the Dave Pearson legacy all the more worthwhile. The studio has been transformed from dereliction to an organised and welcoming place to encounter Dave Pearson's work. But Bob Frith reminds us that the outcome might have been very different. I mean, it's conceivable under slightly different circumstances that the work could have been tipped skipped, thrown away, burned. That could quite easily have happened. Now it is time to catalogue the work and make it fully accessible to a new audience. But what do people further afield make of the Dave Pearson phenomenon? Distinguished writer and broadcaster Edward Lucy Smith. I think what you have to think about is that it's part of the modernist situation uh, that you have these isolated artists weaving their webs, creating their worlds, and that these worlds are only discovered very often much later. And there have even been examples of this much further back. That is, Vermeer was not celebrated in his lifetime, and if he was known at all, uh, he was known as an art dealer, not as an artist. So this situation is not entirely new, that of the, the isolated talent. Even, even Lowry falls to some extent into that bracket. When you get an artist like this who creates a whole world, and that is what he seems to have done, then it's really helpful if you can see the whole of that world. That is, if you can get a grasp. It's very rare to be able to get a grasp of an artistic personality by knowing the entire production, by knowing his ideas and all the rest of it. And I think that in this case it's very fascinating that so much has been preserved uh, because it gives people a chance to see exactly how he moved towards the finished work. 
we want to know how it happened. That is, we're infinitely curious. We want to get inside the artist's mind. 